and we're going to start talking about Module 4. Now, Module 4 is about loops because we're going to get loopy. And this is kind of our second foray into two things. First, well, it's our first foray into reusability. Now, you will find out through the next several weeks that reusability is one of my favorite topics in programming. Um, it may seem obscure, however, reusability, if you, if you write your code right, then you end up writing less code if you make it reusable. And reusable is things like functions and objects and loops. And reusability is about data-driven code. Okay, I want to write one function, one loop that can handle a lot of different data input. And we're going to do that tonight. We're going to use the same set of code and the behavior is going to change based on what's happening in the loop. And this is an important concept because you're going to have to use it for your game. You will have a gameplay loop. That loop will be a while loop. And as we go through the next couple of um, modules, we're going to talk more about the upcoming project. So it's important to get loops down, not, not just for their own sake, but because you need to understand it to do your project. So what is reusability? Well, I don't mean cut, it's not copying and pasting code. Um, it's using loops and functions and objects to use the same sequence of steps to do different things based on the data that comes in. And uh, uh, reduces the amount of code is an important thing here. There is a metric. It's a generalized metric, but it says basically if you catch a bug in requirements, it'll cost you a dollar. If you catch it in design, it will cost you $10. If you catch it in coding, it will cost you $100. And if you catch it at, if the customer catches it at their site, it will cost you 1000 So basically, the more code you write, the more potential there is for errors. We're all human. We make errors. Um, so if you can simply reduce the amount of code you write, because you're writing it in a reusable manner means that you will have less code to maintain and there are less opportunities for there to be bugs. And I don't like writing the same thing twice. I, I prefer to be able to write um, some things, you know, something once and make sure it works and it's solid and I don't have to go back to it for years. So we have some new keywords and some new descriptions. So we have two keywords for loops. There is a while loop and there is a for loop. While tells Python that it's going to make a decision repeatedly and for tells Python that it's going to make a decision repeatedly. So why do we have two? Well, the while loop requires a specific exit condition and we have to write that condition and keep track of that condition in the loop. For also requires an, an, an exit condition, but the exit condition is part of the iterative decision process, and I'll explain what that means in a bit. While loop and for loops are both going to be very important, a while loop is going to be your gameplay loop. And the exit condition is going, you're going to have two exit conditions. You're going to have an exit condition where your professor or whoever it is is testing it can put in a, the word quit or exit and it stops. Or the, the player won the game or didn't win the game. Some, some condition happened where um, the game makes a decision to stop. We also have a new keyword called in. In basically says is the value I'm looking for contained in a sequence. Break stops the loop. It just stops and exits the loop. Everything's done. Continue stops the execution of the loop, but it goes back to the top. And I'll explain more about what that is, and we'll see some visuals about what that is in just a few minutes. Okay. 
New concepts, iteration. An iteration is the execution of a block of Python statements within a loop until an X and condition is met. So you're just going to keep going through the loop, through the loop, and each time you go through one round of that loop, it will be an iteration. A seminal value is a special value, and this determines the, the termination condition of the loop. And sentinel values are important in our while loops. So we're going to start with while loops. And a while loop, you know, is, I don't think I said it explicitly yet. This loops are an extension of branches. Loops are about making decisions repeatedly. And the, we're making them using the same code. And what changes is the data that is being checked. So the logic of the loop is always the same. But the outcome of that will change based on the value of a variable. That's what I mean by data. So first of all, for a while loop, we have to have this test variable. Um, that is not going to be equal to our sentinel value, OK? In this case, I have a variable test. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of the single equal sign, I have a word called go. It's just a value. Now, the next line down, there is a keyword called while. This says, hey, Python, I'm getting the block of code that's inside me, that's in my local scope, because we're still dealing with scopes here from now on, where there's going to be a, a, a global scope and a local scope. While loops, for loops, just like if, else, else statements have local scopes. So while is a keyword. Hey, Python, I'm getting ready to do something. And based on whether or not I keep going, you're going to do the same thing inside my local scope. So I have test. Test is the variable that's going to contain the data that's going to change. Test, the value of test changes. I have a conditional operator just like I had last week with if, elif, with branches because this is a form of branching and we are making decisions. Q is the sentinel value. Q is what test is going to have to equal for this to stop. Because you'll notice I have test is not equal to the letter Q. That means that I'm going to continue to do the stuff, the two lines on the local scope of the while loop until test is Q. And when test is Q, it's all going to stop. And I can read this just like a true-false question. Test is not equal to Q, true or false. Now you'll notice the line above it says test equal go. And that means I can actually enter the loop. If I set test equal to Q, I'd never get inside that loop. I'd never actually start doing any of the local scope code of that loop. So inside are just a couple of lines of local scope. I'm going to print what somebody input. And then I'm going to ask them to, tat, to change the value of test. So I'm going to say, Input a word or cue to quit. Now, test is what changes. The value of test is what changes when we go back to the top of that while loop and we test, test against Q. If they're the same, the lo nothing else will happen in terms of the local scope of this while loop. If they're not, it's going to go back through. It's going to print out your input, and then it's going to ask for more input. OK, a few things to remember. The sentinel value defines the exit condition of this loop. So I'm, here I've got test is not equal to Q. I could also have um, another condition. I could say test is equal to the word quit. And it would only keep going if test was the word quit. 
So there are all kinds of things. What I'm just trying to say is the operators that we learned last week, the relational operators and the Boolean operators, all can be used in a while. This is a simple example, but you can make complex decisions in a loop just like you can in a branch. Um, this while loop will execute until the sentinel value reaches the exit condition. And so in this case, until somebody types the letter Q. And like all conditional statements, while is a statement and must end with a colon. So don't forget the colon. Again, this is some place where students go crazy because they've written all this code and all of a sudden it's getting, they're getting weird errors or things aren't working, and it's because there might not be a colon after at the end of this statement. So now let's just follow this test a little bit. And I also want to kind of clarify some of the terminology that I've just thrown at you. So right now test is go. Test is not Q, so... I'm going to execute the code inside the while loop. By inside, I mean in the local scope. There are two lines of code in the local scope of this while loop, the print and the test. Print of blah, 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 and test equal blah, blah, blah. So my initial value for test is go. Go is not equal to Q, true or false. That is true. So it's going to print some information and then it's going to ask for input. So Professor Lee is going to type hello. We're going to go up to the top of the loop and now test is hello. So the thing that changed is the value of test. Okay, nothing else changed, just that one word changed. So it could change the behavior of the loop. And that's what I mean by data driven code. Based on what test is, something's going to happen. Now, right now, the loop is just going to stop or go, but in your game, there's going to be more stuff happening. And I have completed one single iteration, which means I've executed everything that's to be executed in the loop, and I am now back, Python is now back at the top of the while loop about to test this condition, and it will be hello is not equal to Q, true or false. That's true, so we're going to go back in to the loop. I'm going to execute the print. I'm now going to ask for more input from the user. The user is going to this time input Q. Q goes back up to the top of the loop. I've just completed my second iteration through the loop. And so now Python's going to do the evaluation again. Now, the only thing that changed was the value of test. Test is now the letter Q as opposed to being hello, which it was in the previous iteration. So Python's going to say Q is not equal to Q, true or false. This time, that's false. So what's going to happen is well, we're now testing it. Q, test is Q, and it stops the loop because this has now evaluated to false. All the other times before, it evaluated to true. So now we're evaluating it to false, so the loop stops. This is what I mean by data-driven code. The only thing that changed on those iterations was the value of test. Each trip through the while loop or for loop is caused in it, called an iteration. So let's look at this as a flow chart, and then we'll go out and look at a little code, just because I think it's good at this point to see a visual of what a while loop looks like in a flow chart. So I just have this bit of code. Test is equal to go. If test is not equal to Q, output test, input test, and then go back to that little diamond for the if statement. That is a loop. So if you're, if you're a visual thinker and you need to think about a loop, this is the way you think about it. Um, excuse me. You, you literally can move from the if statement. And it always has to be true if it's going to enter the loop. And then you're going to 
do whatever you do in the loop and then go back to the question. So now we're just going to follow that test again. So hello, hello is not Q, so we're going to output it. The professor's going to input Q, we're going to test it again, and then we're false. Oh, one more thing. Uh, actually, let me do a little bit here. Okay, so what's this one? Uh, while. Okay, this is a good one because, come on, why isn't it? There we go. Now it's making it bigger. This is a good one because it also combines um, if statements. So you can you can have loops inside of loops. You can have loops inside of if statements. You can have if statements inside of loops. All of this can work together. So in this case, we just have a challenge, and we've got while well, user num is greater than zero, and user num is just going to be an input. Somebody's going to input it. So I'm going to have an input up here and an input in the loop. It's important in a while loop that the condition can change, that data-driven condition can change inside the loop. So this has to change here because if it doesn't, this will never. This line of code is gone. It will never be executed again. It's in the global scope. So in the local scope, we have got to change that the, the variable that we're using to test against. So I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do challenge for, of course, it's all the way down here, isn't it? There we go. Okay, so we're going to debug this because we all know I like the debugger. So I am here, I am waiting to input something. So I'm going to input three. So I now have a user num of three. I am going to print body. I'm going to step over that. It's just going to output it. Here's the console. I output body. If I go down to here to variables, I have user num is three. So if user num is less than 10, I'm going to say young. Otherwise, it's going to say old. So I print young. Console, we see young. Variables are still the same. Now I'm about to change user num. Changing user num here also changes user num here. Okay? So it's, it's the same variable. Even though that this is in the local scope, because it was also defined in the global scope, it will change the value in the global scope. So let's look at that. So I'm going to step over, and I'm going to go to the console, and I'm going to enter 42. So now we will see that user num changed to 42. Okay? So it's 42 here. There, come on. I'm, I'm highlighting this. It should tell me, I'm, but it's 42 there as well. There you go. So data-driven code, the only thing I did was change user num, and it's going to change the behavior inside the loop. So I'm now going to print body. So variables, user num is 42. And now user num is not less than 10. So it's going to say old. I'm going to input, and this time I don't want it to do anymore. So I'm going to input a negative number, minus 1, and when it gets here, it's going to exit the loop. Now, I put this print down here so that everybody could see that, in fact, the loop was done. You don't necessarily need to do this when you're doing your own programming, but it's important just for our understanding right now that line 10 is not inside the local scope of this while loop. Okay, we know that because we have to indent in a local scope. Just like with if statements last week, 
If we didn't indent, we got that error message. I'm going to show you the error message again here in a second. So I'm going to print done, and everything's done. So this is nice and happy, but what if I do this? And I run it. Well, I get my indentation error. Because while, just like if statements uh, and all other branching, while says, hey, Python, expect a local scope. This print is not in the local scope because it's left justified. It's under the same column, column zero, as this while loop. If I want to fix that, I have to indent it one. Now, what you'll see is I just tabbed. And I got all these little problems. Well, that's because when I did this, I must not have been tabbing. And what Python tells you you have to do is everything has to be justified appropriately. So even though this is indented, I've tabbed one, this isn't tabbed. And so Python doesn't know what to do with it. It expects all of these to be the same left line. So now we'll start to see all those little squiggles go away when I've lined everything up. Whoops, haven't lined that up yet. So when I've lined everything up, all those red squiggles go away because Python is very picky about its space-delimited nature. So if you're starting to have weird things happen and, you know, you, you it's not, well, it's not, it, it's in a local scope. There's definitely a local scope here. But I have something like this where the second, third, fourth line in my branch or in my loop has that red squiggly. And I run it and it says indentation error. And you're like, this doesn't make sense because I've indented. I indented print. It's in the local scope. That happens because this print and this if are not left justified appropriately. They both have to be at the same, they both have to line up. And if this went into another local scope, they would have to be lined up. The same thing would have to be here. If I did, if I did this, now you'll notice I print here is fine, but here, it's just like one space. What does it matter? It matters a lot to Python. Okay. Python will give you an indentation error. Excuse me. Will give you an indentation error every time. Because it's not completely left justified. It's not it's not indented correctly. And all of a sudden they go away. So that's something to remember, especially when you start writing the longer programs. This is the one thing I don't like about Python is that it is space delimited. I much prefer a language that has a specific delimiter like a semicolon. So I'll get rid of that and we'll go back to the lecture part. Okay. And by the way, everybody, the same rules go in case you haven't come. If you have questions, put them in the chat. I check them. And then when we are done with the lecture, I will um, open it up and we can talk about things. So, counting with a while loop. Now, this is important to know that you can count things with a while loop. I prefer for loops. In fact, in my daily life as a programmer, I use for loops way more than I use while loops. If I am doing something unbounded like threads or something like that, I will use a while loop. But if there is a finite set, whether that be numbers, whether that be something from a dictionary, whether that be an array, I use for loops. Now, for your gameplay loop, you're going to have to use a while. So that's important to know. So this looks kind of similar to what we've done. We've got our test variable, which is counter. Counter has a value of zero. Um, my while loop, excuse me, is like, okay, so Python's going to say counter is less than three true or false. If that's true, then I'm going to print the counter is, and then I'm going to increment counter. So what happens when I increment counter? Increment counter changes the value of counter 
in the local scope. But as we saw in the last, um, in the la in the lab, sorry, in the the challenge, um, since counter was defined externally and it's in the global scope. When we increment counter inside the while loop, in the local scope of the while loop, we actually change it everywhere. We change it for counter. We change the counter in the global scope because they're the same thing. They're looking at that same block of memory. And so when I do that, what happens is I'm just telling the loop, okay, now go up and check counter again. So if I start at zero, I'm going to check counter after I do counter equal counter plus one, which is going to be one, and then I go through the loop again. I'm going to do counter equal counter plus one. Counter will now become two, and that's fine. And then on the third go round, it's going to say sorry, because you are now at three, and three is not less than three. So that's how you count with a while loop. If you don't do a lot of counting with while loops in this class, and I'm not going to worry about this that much. I wanted to introduce it. But you do need to understand while with sentinel values because that's for your gain. And if you're going to do counting, you're almost always going to do it with a for loop. Okay, so now we're going to talk about for loops. So for loops have a little bit of a different anatomy than while loops. For loops, you'll notice there's no value that's been defined in the global scope. There's no variable line of code above that four, okay? And that's because that variable is defined in the statement of the for loop itself. And that's something new. We have never done that before. So if I look at this line of code in front of me, I have four. Four is the keyword, and it's going to tell Python you're about to make decisions repeatedly, same way Wild did. Now I have this word num. There's nothing special about the word num. I could have made it Fred. It is a variable that is defined and will be used only in the local scope of this for loop. But I didn't have to define it outside the for loop. In is a keyword that says, hey, Python, expect a sequence to come next. And then and we're going to talk about range in a few minutes. Range is a special function with its own slide, but basically range creates a sequence. It, in this case, it creates a list. And so I can read this as long as num is less than three, keep going. And then I can print num is format num. And it will only execute if num is less than three. Now, this is how you count with a for loop. Let me escape and say this is two lines of code. This is one, two, three, four lines of code to do the exact same thing. If I can write fewer lines of code, I'm going to, which is why I use for loops a lot more than I use while loops because I'm writing less code. I'm taking advantage of the things that Python is giving me for free and making my life easier. This is just part of being able to program efficiently and effectively because I'm not, I'm not independently wealthy. I program as my job and also because I love what I do. Um, so it's my somebody's paying me to be hopefully smart enough to write efficient and effective code. And one of the ways you write efficient and effective code is not writing additional code. Um, so two lines of code as opposed to four lines of code that do the same thing, I'm always going to choose two lines of code. So range is a special function, function used for loops. Um, sorry, used with for loops. For is a statement. It's got to end with a colon. Don't forget the colon. Um, for loops define, define a special variable that is only accessible inside the for loop. And in this case, we called the variable num. 
could have been I, could have been Fred, could have been counter, doesn't matter. It simply has to follow the uh, nomenclature defined in what's a valid variable name. Okay, so range. We're going to talk a little bit about range, and then I'll show you an example of range in, Py in PyCharm. So range is a special function. It's given to us by Python. We don't do anything for it. It's just there for our, us to use. Range is almost always used with the in keyword. And um, the in keyword is, is basically, it's going to say, is the value of the variable that I am testing in a given sequence? In this case, the value would be in the variable called num, and um, and that's what Python's going to do. It says, is the value num in range of three? Now, what is range of three? Range is a function. Range takes up to three arguments. Now, this is the first time we've really started to deal with optional arguments. Format has them, but we haven't talked a lot about it. In this case, Python has this great ability that not all languages do. You can set up a default value, and then you don't have to add more lines, more code. So I can set a value for start and a value for increment and never have to pass them. So even though range takes three arguments, I only actually have to ever tell it one, and that's the stop. It will always assume that start is zero, and it will always assume that increment is one. Now, we have to remember that stop, that stop value, is not going to be, it's not going to include the number. So it's not going to stop when num is greater than three, it's going to stop when num is three. So it will never get into the for loop if num is the same as 3. If the value of num is 3. Um, and that's partly because when we get into lists, we'll learn a little more, but list indexes of list start at 0. So you're going to start at 0 in a range, and you're going to end at 1 minus that stop value. And that's so that it matches up with how lists work in Python. Um, let's see, for the num range, so let's just go over this. You don't need me this time. I'm not putting in anything. So we're just going to follow this through. So I have num in range, and range is going to do this. It's going to create a sequence of three numbers, 0, 1, and 2. 0 is going to be assigned the value of num. I don't have to do anything. Python's doing all this for me. It's going to print out num is 0. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. When I am now back up to the top of the loop, Python, again, without my intervening, is going to now assign the second value in the sequence, which is the number 1, to num. It's going to do the test. It's going to print it out. It's going to go back up to the top of the loop. Again, I haven't told it anything. It's doing this all on its own for me. So now... I am going, Python's going to say, okay, now I've got one more number in the sequence. Num is now going to be 2. I'm going to print num is, and then I'm going to go up to the top of the loop. There's nothing more in the sequence. I haven't assigned it a 3. 3 was never part of the sequence because range created it starting at 0. So it's three numbers starting at 0, which would be 0, 1, and 2. And then I'm done. That's that simple. Two lines of code that run themselves, and I'm done. All I have to do is figure out what goes on in this for loop, and will that, in fact, change anything associated with how I'm running? So, flowchart with a for loop. Now, this is going to look kind of like we just saw with a while loop. So, in this case, I have num equals zero. I'm less than 3. If that's true, I'm going to output num. I am then going to say num equal num plus 1. And I'm going to go back up to my decision and false. It ends. So this looks like a loop. 
It looks very much like the while loop. And there are some things in this that I didn't have in the code. I didn't have a line of code that says num equal num plus one. Well, I didn't have a line of code because I didn't need it. It's Python, something Python did by itself. Flowcharts are language agnostic, so you don't, you can't assume that they're going to do that. Why did I show you this? Because it's important to understand, especially when you're starting to write more complex flowcharts for things like your game and your functions in your game, to understand that it's not, it's not Python specific. When you're doing design, design is not language specific. And so this is what a for loop looks like. And it's very similar to what a while loop looks like. So let's go and do a little bit of code, um, which is this. No, I don't want any while loops. I want for loops. OK. Okay, so let's just do this because it gives us a bunch of different for loops um, that do things. For LM in range zero, where does LM come from backwards? All right, let's run this. I may not have put all this in right. Ah, here we go. Got it. Okay, now I know what I'm talking about. Took me a little, took me a second. I was a little slow on the uptake tonight. Okay, 4.5.1. Okay. So, what do I have here? Well, I'm going to do some stuff with stock price information. Because, you know, as we do, as all teachers are, we're big in the stock market. So I'm going to enter, enter a series of stock prices, and then we're going to do some things with it. We're going to print it out. We're going to print um, the length of the stock price, and we're going to print the stock price. Oh, anyway, let's take a look. And by the way, we're using this split, which we've talked about in the past, and it is going to take a comma-separated list, comma separated string, and turn it into a list. So let's debug this. And I'm going to go to console, and I'm going to enter my stock prices. Okay, so I've just entered a couple of stock prices. So what do I have? I now have a list of stock prices because we used this split, so it took it from a string to a list. So I have four stock prices. So now I'm going to print them. Let's go back to the console. And that's what I'm doing. I'm going, I say four price in stock price. Now you'll notice I didn't lose, use the range here because I didn't have to. Stock price is a list, which is automatically a sequence. So if I look at stock price, if I hold my, I have my sequence, and so what Python's going to do in this for loop, it's it's simply going to, every time it hits this for loop again, it's going to assign the next value in the sequence to the variable price. So right now, the vari it's been assigned 1.11, and we've printed out the first price. So now when I step over, you will see price has changed to 2.22, which is the second value in the sequence. So I'm going to print that out. And it's going to happen with 3. And it's going to happen with 4. And as soon as I'm done with all the elements in that sequence, I'm done with that loop. Python stops it for me. So now I'm going to have Elm in range of 0 to the length of stock price. So now what I want to do is I want to print stock price price that is stock price of, we can, we can use that as an of, whatever the index value is, is, and then it's going to be, give me the price itself. So this is just another way to print it out, but it also helps us understand how the range can work. Okay, so here I'm starting at zero, which is good because my sequence will start at zero. 
as we can see here. And I'm going to go to Lens stock price. Why am I not? You know, Lens stock price is four. So why am I going to four and not three? Well, because I have four elements in the list. Remember, every index, every list starts at an index zero. So you always have to go to length minus one. Range already does that for us. So we don't have to change anything here. We just have to say, go to, go to the length of my particular sequence. So I'm just going to walk through this. I'm going to say stock price. So LM is zero. Stock price at LM is zero is 1.11. I'm going to do LM1, LM2, LM3, and now LM4. I don't have to do any more. I'm done. So now I'm going to go backwards. This is important because you may just have to have a for loop that goes backwards. And we'll look at a little bit more of this in a minute. Again, I have alum. It's okay to use alum. This alum has nothing to do with this alum. They will be treated as separate things. I'm going to have my range. And in this case, I'm going to go from the length of the stock price, minus 1, to zero, and I'm going to increment by minus one. Increment by minus one will mean I'm going to go back over, I'm going to go backwards over the sequence. So in this case, I'm going to start with stock prices of three is 4.44, .44, two, and one, and I'm done. So, oh, I didn't actually make it to zero. Okay, yeah, that, that would be the way that was written. So that's how to use four over sequences with range in a couple of ways and without range. I didn't need a range here because I already had a sequence on line four. Okay. So more about range. Um, print every other number between one and five inclusive. You might have a lab like this this week. So basically, I have four num. Num is just a variable again in range, one comma six comma two. What does that mean? That means create me a sequence starting with the, the number one, ending with one minus six, and increment by two. So what this does is this gets you odd numbers between one and five. So I'm going to have num, I'm going to go 4, and then I'm going to print num is, and it's going to say num is 1, it's going to go back up to the top of the loop. Num is 3, it's going to go back up to the top of the loop. Num is 5. Now you might just have a lab that talks about doing things in odd and evens, and this is a way to do things with your odds and your evens. And then you're done, of course. So. We can nest loops. Now, I know we've just thrown a bunch of stuff at you about loops, and we're about to make it more complex. And we're doing it by adding more loops. Okay, so this is important because you need to learn to do things. If you're going to be programming, you need to learn to do things by breaking the depth of the data down. Now, if I'm thinking about a list, I just have a number of elements separated by commas. That's pretty easy. But now, think about that I have a, a sequence, a list, and that list contains other lists. What in the world would that look like, and why in the world would I do that? Well, why you would do it is a spreadsheet, okay? Spreadsheets are matrices. They are rows and columns. If you look at a spreadsheet as a comma-separated value file, you will see a row of values with comma-separated and then another row with comma-separated and another row with comma-separated. And what you do with that is you use nested loops because you will go through the entire set a row at a time. So you get to the row, and then you actually get to the data. And that's what nested loops are for. So 
if, oh, let me stop for a second. If I'm looking at this, I have the value rows, and it's inputting a number of rows, and I'm going to input a number of columns. And then what I want to do is I want to print the number of rows and the number of columns, and we're using a nested loop to do that. Now, this is going to be similar to, I believe, a uh, lab you'll have where you actually have to print a right triangle. So this is close, but it's not, it's not exactly that. So what I have is I, in the four loops, I have four outer in-range rows and then four inner in-range columns. And I'm going to print a star, and I'm going to end them with a space. And then I'm going to print, when I'm all done with, with each row, I'm going to then print a new line. And you know what? I'm going to go through this, not on the slide, but I'm going to go through this um, actually in the code. I think it'll be clearer. Let me know if you don't think it is. So this is, what was that? Sorry about that. I just lost the number in my head. 4.1.3, that's not right. 4.13 maybe? Let's go look. Four dot. Okay, that's while. That's while. Mm. Okay, given num rows and num columns, print the list of all seats in a theater. We could go through that. Uh, that's not it. I apologize. I don't know what happened to that. Nested four. Inner times outer. I don't know what I did with that. Okay, well, we're going to go with one similar. And that's not it. That's it. So given rows and columns, print a list of all seats in a theater. Okay, that'll work. Well, you know, I'd rather do the one I'm talking about because it's closer to the lab. So give me a second. Well, we'll just do this. Okay. And we'll do this. No. Apologize for this. It does not like it when I copy those in. Okay, we're backing this one out. We're just going to do this guy. Sorry about that. I'll make sure that that's in there next time and when I do it tonight. Come on. Why isn't it? Do not know why it's not allowing me to um, zoom in. So, um, what we're going to do is we're just going to print the number of the list of all the seats in a theater. Rows are numbered, columns are lettered. So it's A1 or 3E and print a space after each seat. So how we're going to do this, I still can't, oh, there we go. There we go. Sorry about that. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask for two inputs. I'm going to ask for a num rows and a num columns because this is a matrix. And I'm going to print a new line. And then I'm going to say for cur row in range 1, num rows plus 1. Because in this case, I'm giving it the number of rows that I have, but I want it to actually end with that num rows. And then I'm going to say cur call let A. So I'm just going to say A is the current column. And then I'm going to say cur call in range 1, num calls plus 1. And I'm going to print format her row, her call, and then end it with a space. And then I'm going to um, 
get the character and then go back up to the top of the loop. But what I want to really display, demonstrate in here is what happens in a multidimensional array because that's what this is. So is that right? 482. Let's go get that. Uh, 482. There we go. So, can I make that a little bigger? Yeah, that's better. So now I'm going to start the debugger because we all know I like the debugger. And it wants me to print a number of rows. So I'm going to say it's got four rows and five columns. So, now, I am here at the top of the outer for loop. So the, this for loop is outer, this for loop is inner, and we will notice that this is inside the local scope of the outer for loop, which means it's not available in the global scope. It's only available inside this for loop. So, per row in range, so I'm starting with one because I don't have a seed zero. And I want to go to num rows plus one because I actually want the number of rows. I actually want the four rows that I that I told that I want. So I want 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, and not 0A, 1A, 2A, 3A. So I'm just saying the current column letter is A. And now I have my columns. So I have num columns. Num columns is five. So range is going to create me a sequence. Again, it's going to start at 1, which is different than what we had originally talked about in the slides. But it's going to start at 1 because I want my columns to be 1, 2, 3, not 0, 1, 2. And then I'm going to go to my end value is going to be num columns plus 1. So in this case, that will be 6 so that I actually get row columns 1 through 5. So let's just go through the loop, and it's going to print uh, just the current row and the current column letter, and then it's going to end. So what did I get on the console? I got 1A. So now I'm going to step over this, and guess what? I don't go all the way out to the top loop. I'm staying inside the local scope, and I am in the inner for loop. So I'm going to step over this. Now, why didn't I go all the way up to, the, to line 15? I didn't go all the way up to line 15 because Python knows I haven't finished with lines 17, 18, and 19 yet because I haven't evaluated all of the possible columns. So Python automatically is not going to go back up to the outer loop. It's going to stay in that inner loop until it's done or until you tell it to stop. So it could be done and then stop. And then we're going to talk in a few minutes about some ways to tell it to stop. So we're going to step over. And now the current column is 2. So I'm going to now have 1B. I'm going to have 1C, still in that inner loop, 1D, 1E. Now, I just went to the outer loop. I went to the outer loop because right now, everything in that inner loop was done. So what's going to happen now? Well, Python's going to say, okay, have I finished with all the stuff for num rows? Well, no, I haven't because I've only been on one. So now I'm going to step over. Now, cur row is 2. I'm going to start back at letter A. Letter A is just going to start again because I want to start again at A. The second row is going to be 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D, 2E. So let's see. Now, when I hit line 17, when I hit this inner loop, Python is acting as if, okay, we're starting from scratch. Whatever we're starting with, we're starting from scratch. So I am going to step in. Now, the only thing that will be different between row 1 and row 2 is cur row. Because cur row is going to be 2, and 
the column again starts today because I told it to right there. So now I'm going to print the, the seats for row um, two. And now I'm on to row three. Same thing. I'm going to finish row three before I go to row four. Here I'm going to go to row four. In the inner loop, the only thing that's changed is this cur row. But I'm going to go through now the inner loop. Again, almost as it's brand new, the only thing that changed was what I get from the outer loop. And so the outcome is going to be done when I'm done with four. So that is what my seating chart looks like. And that's what an inner and outer loop are. This is the inner loop. This is the outer loop, which contains the inner loop. Um, and so this is an important concept to note, and you're going to have to build a triangle with it this week. Okay. And everybody's quiet. Have I left you all in the dust? Are you guys, like, not understanding? Or am I just doing a really good job this time? And you don't have to answer that. So break. Remember when I said that I could tell it where to stop? Well, that's what the break keyword does. The break says, don't pass go, don't collect $200, just stop. So here, I just have some Python code. that I'm going to use a while loop because maybe you're going to have to use a break with a while loop. And maybe in your program, in your game, you're going to have to use a break in a while loop. So in this case, my test is just not equal to done. I'm going to say, what's the answer? And then, excuse me, if the answer is time, I'm going to um, print, I don't have a clock. If it's 42, I'm going to print the right answer, and then I'm going to break. And if it's else, I'm going to print try again or, print, or um, type done to stop. And actually, I'm going to see... Yeah, we're 10 o'clock. I'm just going to see if I've got something good. Oh, I got an answer. So I used a while loop for this, but in my inner loop, I tried while less than or equal to and couldn't get to work. But if I set it to C, it worked. I'll need to take a look at your code, Jeffrey because I don't have a clear picture of what those loops looked like in my head. But we can talk about that when we're done tonight, if you want. Okay, so... Okay, Sorry? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. Uh, what do I have? Um break. We'll use this one. So, um, so if the Simon pattern is not equal to you, the user pattern, break. So what this is doing is I'm having a while true. And if I say while true, it says run forever. I don't recommend you do this unless you're dealing with, you know, certain types of, um, of threads or long-lived things when you're writing code. But anyway, while true, and then it's going to say if Simon pattern is not equal to user pattern break, otherwise user score plus equal one, user pattern input. And then we're going to input the user pattern again, and it's going to keep going. So let's do this. Four, ten. Um, okay. So as always, we're going to write, use the debugger because we know I like the debugger. So I'm going to print in the Simon pattern is um, is going to be A B C D E, and the user pattern is going to be A B C D E. So is user pattern the same as Simon pattern? Yes, they are. So I'm not going to break. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to say, okay, I've gotten a user score of one. So now I'm going to 
ask user to input again. So I'm going to input A, B, C, D, E. Simon pattern and user pattern are the same. So I will not enter the if statement. I'm going to add my user score up and I'm going to wait for user input and user input is going to be done. So now I'm here. Simon pattern and user pattern are not going to be the same. So I'm going to end up in a break. So this break statement, and I apologize for the semicolon. When I was typing this in, I was obviously thinking Java. Break says stop immediately. Don't do anything, just stop. So it's going to stop. It's not going to add anything to user score. It's not going to add, ask me to do a user pattern again. It's simply going to drop down to the first line that is outside the local scope of that while loop, which is line 24, and line 24 is going to print a score of 2. That's what break does. Uh, we also have continue. Continue does something very close, and I won't go over this because I don't think we need it in the labs, but continue basically says if you hit a condition, don't go any further in the code, just go back up to the top of the loop. Just stop here, don't break out of the loop, but keep going. I don't want you to do anything else after. So instead of going through the lab pseudocode, I'm gonna, sorry, the lab, um, I'm gonna go through the uh, pseudocode. Okay, so here's the lab for pseudocode. Um, so here I want a line of text and I'm going to output the number of characters and I'm going to exclude spaces, periods, or commas. So this is an, a prime opportunity for using a for loop in my mind. Um, I'm going to input um, the user text, whatever that is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for character in user text. So if the character is not equal to a space and the character is not equal to a period and the character is not equal to a comma, then I'm going to increment care count. And when I'm done, I'm going to output care count. So that's what I'm going to do. So I can use a while loop here if I want, but I really think a for loop is the best thing. And the for each, make sure you're indenting it properly. And I put that in here, what's inside and outside, so you guys can understand what the indentation should be. Okay, so now we're getting a little bit, um, a little bit more complex. So here what we're doing is we're modifying passwords. So somebody's going to input a word. And I'm going to create a password from that word. So while, um, and here's one of those things where I'm going to, I say while care count is less than length of the word. That's completely acceptable. I could do a for loop here. But I have to do a for loop. Um, I, could do a, I could do a for loop here too. You can do a for loop or while loop. So the basic thing here is this is not multidimensional, but what you're having to do is you're having to test for the things that need to be modified. So if my the character of this that uh, that I'm on is an I, I'm going to replace that with an exclamation point. I'm going to replace an A with an A, a lowercase m with an uppercase m, a B with an A, and a zero, and an O with a dot. And what I'm going to do during this is going to build up a new password character by character. So if I have this set password up at the top, so if the character is equal to an I, then I'm going to set password equal password plus exclamation point, not I. If none of those characters match, if the character is not an I, an A, a lowercase m, an uppercase B, or a lowercase O, then I'm just going to say password equal password plus the current character that I'm on. And I'm going to do that as 
I move through whatever the password, the, the word that was typed in is, and I'm also going to keep a character count because if I'm doing this in a while loop, then I have to keep a character count. If you choose to do it as a for loop, and if you're in my class, that's fine, um, then you don't have to worry about this extra character count. And then at the end of the password, I'm going to say Q star S, and then I'm going to print out the password. So that's 4.5, and that's how you use the loop. And it's just a big set of conditions, if, elif, 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 else. Um, so here, what we are doing, um, this is a, a nested loop. And I put while in here, and I think I did that to talk about pseudocode, because pseudocode is language agnostic. Now, I probably could have put four in here. But I didn't because I'm doing pseudocode. When you do your pseudocode, you're not going to say, I'm not, you're not going to assume that, oh, I have four and Python's going to do all this stuff for me. You could use a for loop here and make things tighter and easier. So basically, here I am creating a right triangle. And I'm going to have, I'm going to put in a character and a height. So I'm going to set, I'm going to say, while well, counter is less than the height, so height is some number, I'm going to set the inner counter to zero. You're always going to start the inner counter at zero. I'm going to say, well, inner counter is less than or equal to counter, because I don't want all of them. I'm going to output the care, and then I'm going to increment the inner counter, I'm going to output a space when the inner counter is done. I'm going to set counter equal counter to plus one. I guess this is a box. This is not a right triangle. And then go up to the top of the loop and do it again until height is completely done. So that's how you're going to do that particular assignment. Oh, one more. My apologies. Now, this one seems to be very short, and it's very nice. So basically... I'm going to put in a word and some tokens. And what I'm going to do is um, output eating tokens of one space tokens of zero a day keeps the doctor away. So eating an apple a day keeps the doctor away. That would be the kind of thing you're doing with this. And then I'm going to input a word, and then I'm going to enter put a token, and, and then do it again. So what is happening here is when I put quit in, then I'm going to stop. And only then am I going to stop. So that's what this particular one is about. It's really just about understanding how to write your code to do the sentinel values. So that was a long one. Does anybody have any questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, I'm going to call it. You guys have a great evening and a great weekend, and I will do my best to have this up tomorrow. Um, might have to do it later on tomorrow evening because I am traveling some tomorrow, but I will try and get it up on Friday. You guys have a great weekend, and I will talk to you later. You're welcome, great. Janet. Sorry, do you have a quick moment? Sure, I have a quick moment. Sorry, just revisiting. I didn't know if you met additional questions, but uh, if you have a quick moment for the one. Yeah. Um, just trying to make sense of it. And um, Can you paste your code into the chat? Yeah, so forgive me. That's what I was going to do. And then because it was one of the um, challenge areas, it's, it's marked as complete, but it's not there anymore, what I entered. I hate that it does that. Is there a way to download or repopulate once you've completed one of those? No. And by the way, the challenges aren't graded, just to let you know. I know. I like to, well, in the first lecture you mentioned, and very much appreciate that because I was still learning and struggling with them, but I agree that, you, as you said, that they uh, are extra. Yeah. You I, know, they kind of yeah. help you understand so, the material and everything. Yeah. Um, um, so I don't know how, I don't know that you can get that back. Yeah. 
So I would need, and I would need to see the code that you're talking about. So yeah. unless you try and rewrite the code, I can't really help you. So I figured it was uh, it. It was the uh, the challenge. I'm sure that doesn't really help you. It was the challenge that did the um, it did the seating. It did the one. Yeah. But it only went. It happened to only go up to C as far as the columns, and that's uh, as I said in the chat how I ended up getting it to work. But I couldn't understand why it kept sitting when I did what I put in the chat when I did the character conversion thing. Uh huh. If I'm making sense, when I did that, it kept saying um, expecting string value of one or something like that. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense or not. No, it kind of doesn't. I did. I figured. I was just yeah. really hopeful it was still going to be here, and it's the blank. Next it's time just... you have something like that, just take a screen capture. Yeah, I forgot that it just removes everything. I went back to grab it, and it just says, yeah. you know, the, the the default of your solution goes here, is there, and my code is gone. But. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. It's okay. Like I said, it's marked as complete, and done. Well, like you said, no points, but uh, yeah. I was trying to make sense of what it was saying and why I couldn't use that as the end value as far as uh, the range, setting it to say while um, the inner loop was less than or equal to, and then the conversion.